Welcome to Sunday Morning at First Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Danny Deeth, and in response to the events of the amazing resurrection at Easter, it now becomes our job to discern how we respond to the events of Holy Week and Christ being raised from the dead. We are to discern how we are being led to live, to change our lives, to care for others, to welcome others to Christ's table. This is our call and our challenge. Let's do this together. Come on in. Our first reading comes from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then suddenly destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness, for that day to you <laughs> are not in darkness, for that day to surprise you like a thief in the night. For you are all children of light and children of the day, so we are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not fall asleep as others do, but for us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, as indeed you are doing. Our second lesson is taken from the book of Judges. We don't often hear much about Judges, but listen for Deborah and Barak and Jael. Judges 4, 1 through 9. The Israelites did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth HaGoim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lipidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go, take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops. I will give him into your hand. Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, happy Thanksgiving. We are there. It is this week. It is exciting. And how many people are already in Christmas mode? You don't have to raise your hands. It's okay. I know, because you start seeing it in August. Before Halloween, you start to see it creeping in little bits and pieces here or there. And after Halloween, we might as well be in December. Now, this is a little bit of my old man get off my lawn rant, but I'm not ready yet. I'm part of 
that crew that needs to get through Thanksgiving first, and then first week of December, I'm all in and I am ready. As a matter of fact, I get mad. That's right, I have displaced and replaced two of my preset channels on my car radio because they've gone to 24-7 Christmas music and I am not ready. <laughs> there is division in the Deef household about when we should put the tree up. Traditionally, we wait till after Thanksgiving and then get to Christmas. But some are not happy with that. Already this week, they're doing 24 hours of National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Rudolph, all of it, all of it was on this past week, and it's not even Thanksgiving. So yes, we all love Christmas, we all want to get there, but my reasoning is twofold. Number one, you spread it out so far that it ceases to be as special as we want it to be, because now it's six months out of the year is Christmas. But the second thing is, is that we can so quickly gloss over November that we forget the importance and specialness of Thanksgiving. And my guess is we do a pretty good job on Thanksgiving Day as we gather with friends and family and we share a meal, we have a little bit of peace, a little bit of celebration, but gratitude is so much more than just at that table. We know that. At the end of the day, discipleship is gratitude, and gratitude is discipleship. Why did those first disciples risk their lives, their families' lives, their well-being? Why did they sacrifice the jobs they had, the lives that they have, to go and spread the word about this Messiah that just came and spent time with them and healed and taught and sacrificed and rose on Easter? Why did they do that? Well, Jesus told them to. But Jesus tells us to do a lot of things we don't do. It's because they experienced and understood what they had been given. As a people, we do not follow Christ because we follow a vengeful or wrathful God that when we step out of line, we expect God to smite us. Is that love? It isn't. Now, judgment is real. Christ helps us with that, but that's a part of the equation, yes. But we follow God out of gratitude and thanksgiving not out of fear of hell. That's a piece of it. But more so, it's what God has given us in creating the world, that's God the creator, in giving us Christ, that is redeemer, came to redeem us from ourselves, our sin, our death that we couldn't do on our own. And then sustainer, that's the Holy Spirit. We say those big churchy words sometimes, creator, redeemer, sustainer. Those are different parts of the manifestation of the God who created us and loves us. That's why we give thanks for what was done on the cross, what was done in the empty tomb thousands of years ago. And we give thanks because we know God has been in our lives, has led us through difficult times, has helped us to celebrate, has filled us with gifts, has given us so much, so much. And that's why we follow, to say thank you to God. That's why we want others to know how much they have been blessed by this God who wants to share peace, hope, love, and joy, even in the midst of the worst of the terror and suffering and pain that this world can, can dish up. Gratitude in and of itself can be fleeting, and I think that's where we mostly treat it. But as Vicki said, 
To make gratitude and thanksgiving a spiritual discipline, it means like any other discipline, you practice it and you take time. And we're generally pretty good at the things that are the closest to us, our family, our friends, our jobs, our homes. For all of those things, yes, and absolutely we give thanks to God because we've been giving gifts of all of those things. But it becomes more deep. It becomes more fulfilling when we stop and we think, okay, outside of that core piece that we're thankful for, what else in the world are we thankful for? Some of those things on that list, Chick-fil-A smells. <laughs> There's so much that if we don't stop that we can easily take for granted. There is so much in our amazing lives, in our amazing world, that we just expect on a daily basis, and we forget the wonder and the miraculous nature of every day and every night, and about a God who is in charge despite all of the brokenness that we see. Gratitude is prayer. Gratitude is study. Gratitude is serving others. Gratitude is discipleship. And so I encourage you to take time, not just in this season of thanks, but especially after, to practice your gratitude. And is it, what does it do for you? Vicki told us some of the experiences that she has had in literature that she has read talks about when we share our gratitude with others and when we give out of thanks for others, we are changed. Last Wednesday night, y'all should have been there. You should come every Wednesday night because there's always good stuff. Vicki led the program and it was on Gratitude. She showed us a video, about seven minutes, a YouTube channel called Soul Pancake. That's right, Soul Pancake. And it was in the area of gratitude. And these were research, uh, a group of researchers who were doing a study on happiness. And they invited four people to come, four or five people. They didn't know why they were there. And they were encouraged to close their eyes and think of one person who has been special and important to them and then write a note of thanks and admiration for that person. So they did that and then they said, here's a phone, call them. And with the exception of one, because one was an older gentleman, elderly gentleman whose influential person was a professor of business and economics when he was in college, but the other ones were two family members and a friend. And so they called and they read them these little paragraphs or letters that they had written of thanks and affirmation. Now, it was powerful and it was beautiful, meaningful. And if you're the person receiving gratitude, it's beautiful for you. But what they were measuring in this is what did it do for the giver of gratitude? What did it do for the giver of this gift to others? So they were rating happiness, and I, I don't know what their definition of happiness is. To me, happiness is a fleeting kind of circumstantial peace that comes and goes. I almost like the term better of well-being. So they kind of gauge that on the way in, and after they wrote their letter and then shared with their person on the phone, they realized that the ones who just wrote letters had an increase in their happiness, their well-being from two to 4%. That's not bad. But for the ones who called and made a connection and shared with that person and heard the response on the other end and, and received that love and relationship from that call, their happiness, their well-being increased 4 to 19%. And what that tells us is that when we share gratitude, when we share gifts, when we give to others, 
It impacts us and helps us to grow, to cope, to live, to be well. Often when we get stuck in difficult places, my prescription has always been go and serve someone. And in that same vein, stopping to give gratitude to others and to realize that what you have been given is so much and so much joy. And when we share these things with others, it has profoundly positive and transformative qualities on ourselves. One of the things that I want us to be thankful for is each other. Turn right now to the person next to you and say, I'm thankful for you. All right, that's enough. Paul, in his letter to Thessalonica in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, talks about the importance of the church community and that we can't really do it without each other. God, uh, uh, Paul was talking to them about the end times. They had several people die. So in a young church, they're trying to figure out where do the dead, what happens to the dead people and where is Jesus and what's the second coming all about. And he says, for God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope everyone hears that. That's a whole sermon in itself. We often hear that our God of wrath um, is destined to smite us. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other as indeed you are doing. And in the salutation, the opening of 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. So for Paul, that becomes a sign of your Christian journey, that our love for one another is increasing. That means that we are thinking about one another, praying for one another, spending time with one another, seeking to be the family of faith we have been called to be. We know we can't do this on our own. One commentator about the Thessalonians passage even said, the best assurance for salvation and forgiveness is each other. Each other. Why? Because we see Christ in one another. None of us has the truth exclusively. We all have pieces of it. And the more that we come together and share, the more that we see, understand, are accountable, we inspire one another, and that is the Spirit working through all of us. And so in this season of gratitude, I commend you to, again, see this as a spiritual discipline, not something you just do around the turkey on that one day. For the more that we think and pray and let this become a spiritual discipline, the more we are transformed and the more gifts that we can share with others who need it, the more gifts that we can share with this congregation who then takes it out into the world, the more we are transformed. So give thanks for what you have been given through God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and give thanks for one another in this place and all of you out there who were a part of our extended church family. And in doing so, we will be the people that Christ has called us to be. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>